Good morning and welcome to the Sunday worship with the family at St. Paul Evangelical Lutheran Church in Fayetteville, Pennsylvania. If this is your first time to join us, I'm Vicar Pegg, and I hope that you will find this service to be uplifting and that you will leave here knowing how much you are loved by our merciful God. This is the last Sunday in Epiphany, and so today we will be celebrating the transfiguration of our Lord. In case you might have forgotten, today is also Valentine's Day, and so you still have time to go out and get a card or something. <laughs> but I would say that when we know how much we are loved by our divine creator, it is indeed transforming for each of us, and in fact, on this last Sunday after Epiphany, we will be hearing how God names and claims Jesus, not only as his son, but also as his beloved. And know, dear friends, that you and I and we are all part of God's beloved. Again, welcome, and let us prepare our hearts for worship. You might want to take this time to get a candle uh, remember that we're going to use the ash from the candle for our imposition of ashes on this Ash Wednesday service at, that will premiere here at 6 p.m. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, Resplendent light of your truth shines from the mountaintop into our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading for the last Sunday after Epiphany comes from 2 Kings, beginning at the second chapter. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of the prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted to you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its drivers. But when Elisha could no longer see Elijah, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The psalm for today is Psalm 50, beginning at the first verse. The Mighty One, God the Lord, has spoken. 
calling to the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, perfect in its beauty, God shines forth in glory. Our God will come and will not keep silence with a consuming flame before and round about a raging storm. God calls the heavens and the earth from above to witness the judgment of the people. Gather before me, my loyal followers, those who have made a covenant with me and sealed it with sacrifice. The heavens declare the righteousness of God's cause, for it is God who is judge. The second reading for today is 2 Corinthians, beginning at the fourth chapter. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Gospel for this Transfiguration Sunday is from Mark 9 beginning at the second verse. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace from God our Father, our Creator, our Mother, our everything our Lord and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Fred Lacita lives with his wife and two children in Manila, Philippines. He teaches at the Pennell School of Theology under the direction of Nestor Ruvalis, who provides theological education to grassroots leaders in the margins. Fred writes, Recent events in Myanmar and the Philippines loom large in my mind as I write this reflection from Manila. Time out for a second. Those of you like myself who find themselves geographically challenged, so to speak, might not know, but Myanmar was formerly Burma, and it's in southwest, southwest Asia, with more than a hundred ethnic groups bordering India, Bangladesh, China, Laos, and Thailand. Myanmar is in the midst of a political coup, a military coup, while the Philippine Supreme Court deliberates on the constitutionality of an anti-terror law. The law gives state agents unbridled power to declare who is a terrorist without oversight. As one who serves among the most vulnerable, these turns of events send a chilling message. Sadly, these are not isolated events, and in the last couple of years in different political contexts, we have seen leaders with tyrannical tendencies rise to power, which begs the question, why do we gravitate towards such leaders? It's as if we were struck and stuck with a single paradigm of power and authority that is violent and coercive. In his multi-volume work, Homo Saker, Italian intellectual Giorgio Angerbin 
provides the answer to this question. He says, the West is reared by what he calls sovereign power. The sovereign is the figure in Roman antiquity who enjoys being above the law. The figure of the sovereign is appropriated, appropriated by the Christian West, and it was culminated in the Carolinian Emperor Charlemagne in CE 800. He arrogated to himself both political and religious powers and continues on to this day. It seems to me that this, nation, this notion of power by force has seeped deep into not only the heart of nations, but also into the heart of every human being, if we are honest. Can we move from this paradigm of power? Mark's text for this week invites us to reflect on what it means for Jesus to be transfigured. Here we encounter the scarcity of our imagination about power. For most of us to imagine Jesus as powerful is to conjure up the image of a sovereign, but I believe that that is to miss something critical in the text. Instead, perhaps we're being ushered in to a new way of seeing power and authority. The story of the transfiguration starts with Jesus bringing his disciples up the mountain. He's transfigured before them and his clothes become dazzling white. Then out of nowhere appears Moses and Elijah and they join them. Peter is terrified and perhaps he's a little starstruck and so what does Peter do, who likes to do and take control and is nervous when he doesn't know what's going on? Well, he wants to build tents. Tents were the house of worship. And he wants to build them for Jesus and the Old Testament luminaries. Because remember last week, Peter wanted them to stay in Capernaum. And in Capernaum. And this week, again. He wants to stay on the mountaintop. It's as if Peter is saying that very thing. Let's stay right here, basking in this mountaintop moment forever. Well, Peter's response prefigures much of the church's attitude in the face of a spectacular power to seize and sacralize it. But let's not be too hard on Peter, lest we judge ourselves. Most interpreters view Jesus's transfiguration as an unveiling of his glory, but the word doxa, glory in Greek, is not present in this text. Admittedly, it's implied in Matthew's and it's explicit in Luke's versions of the transfiguration, but that is not the text that we have for this morning. But here in Mark, when Mark uses the term doxa, it is in the context of Jesus' path of suffering and future vindication. Power in the Gospel of Mark is revealed in the cross. What we call powerlessness, God calls power. That's what real mercy looks like. Jesus' transfiguration transforms the way we see power and authority. Real power is not expressed through violence, but in the ability to give voice to the voiceless and to share power with the powerless. His glory is not through a spectacular show of force, but in solidarity with those who suffer and those who are reduced to a bare life. It may not sound like much, but this is the power that liberates me and the community that I serve. And this is the power that frees us from our own tyranny to love and serve. This, it seems to me, is what the gospel is transfiguring now. And it can't happen fast enough. 
In today's mountaintop spirit experience, Jesus invited Peter and James and John into what I will call a reframing experience. It's an experience that provides insight into the journey that they are on with Jesus in the most intimate way with a new definition of power, which ultimately leads to his death and his resurrection. It is in the experience of sight and sound that leaves them in the liminal space of the here and now and in the not yet, wanting to hold on to what has been and unable to comprehend the message of salvation when God speaks directly to them. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. The disciples have received a foretaste of the reconciliation that comes through Jesus' death on the cross. As we begin this preparation for the season of Lent, which begins on Ash Wednesday this week, we are again being called into a season of collective reflection and personal evaluation. A sense of contrite hearts held in seeing and experiencing and knowing the hope and the promise of Easter that we experience every single Sunday as we gather together for worship. This is a season where the Alleluia of praise is buried, and it reminds us that we are but ashes, and to ashes we will return to the earth, and through the power of Jesus' never-ending love and forgiveness, we will be lifted up in the final resurrection. Jesus calls us to a new way of seeing power, the power that comes through love and mercy, the power of love for ourselves and for our neighbors, the power of prayer and reconciliation, the power of the presence of God in our baptism, dying daily to sin and rising again through the power of the Holy Spirit. I invite you this week to reflect on what the Spirit is calling forth in you. On this last Sunday after Epiphany, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need, responding to each petition with the phrase, Alleluia, Amen. Hear our prayer, O God. Alleluia, Amen. O God of light, we pray for communities of faith around the globe, for our own congregation, for our pastors, our vicar, and for all Christians who cannot gather for communal worship. Show us your face in the darkness and speak your word of power to all the faithful. Hear our prayer, O God. Alleluia. Amen. O morning star, we pray for the earth, for life forming in the dark earth and ocean depths, for creatures seen and unseen, and especially for the animals who require cold and ice. Give us your spirit's guidance and our stewardship of the planet. Hear our prayer, O God. Alleluia. Amen. O Son of Righteousness, we pray for our nation's elected leaders for attorneys and juries, and for all who work for justice in our land. Give to them all integrity and service and courage to choose what is right. We pray for our citizenry that prejudice cease, that resentment about the election wane, and that violence be averted. Hear our prayer, O God. Alleluia. Amen. Beautiful Savior, we pray for all who suffer from COVID-19 for medical workers, and for all who wait for the vaccine. We pray for those enduring famine, famine, for those experiencing homelessness, for the people of Yemen, of Myanmar, for all who live in war zones. We pray for all who are ill, for all who receive no medical care, and for those we name here before you. Heal them with your mighty 
Lord. Hear our prayer, O God. Hallelujah. Amen. Love divine, we pray for those who, especially on this Valentine's Day, feel lonely, for those who are abandoned, and for those who must live apart from their dear ones, especially for the children separated from their parents at our nation's borders, and for those in nursing homes and care facilities and hospitals who have yet to be able to see their families. Embrace all who are alone with your care. Hear our prayer, O oh God. Alleluia. Amen. Shine, Jesus, shine also on me and receive the petitions of my heart. Hear our prayer, O oh God. Alleluia. Amen. We remember before you all who have died in the faith, especially the missionaries Cyril and Methodius and the reformer Martin Luther, and for those we name here before you. Be with us in our every darkness until our end, and we join with the saints in your everlasting life. Hear our prayer, O God. Alleluia. Amen. O Holy Trinity, Light Creator, Light of Light Begotten, and Light Revealer, receive our praise and hear our prayers. For the sake of one who dwells among us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Seeing him for this morning is beautiful Savior. Beautiful Savior, King of creation, Son of God and Son of teacher of truth, giver of goodness, we hear your word in the scriptures, proclaiming to us your wisdom and inviting us to follow your call. For speaking this word, we thank you, O God. Your word came among us in Jesus, our brother, 
who preached your righteousness, healed the sick, and revived the brokenhearted. For giving us this word, we worship you, O God. By your Spirit, bless all who receive this word, that upheld by the mystery of the body of Christ, we may be light to the world, revealing the brilliance of your Son, the Beloved, for sustaining us with your word, we praise you, O God, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Just a reminder that you will need this on Wednesday for our service, and that this wick up here is what's going to give you the ashes to be able to do the intinction with our service. Watch for the YouTube channel, uh, the um, URL to be on our Facebook web on Wednesday. And I look forward to seeing you Wednesday and also then again back here next Sunday as we worship together in our home. And now receive the blessing. God, the Creator, strengthen you. Jesus, the Beloved, fill you. And the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, keep you in peace. Amen. I pray that this week for you will be full of blessings as we bury the Alleluia's until after Easter. Let us remember that we don't bury the love of Christ, that we indeed bring the true light through Jesus Christ to the world. Until next week, be safe and we'll see you again.